Why Doubt Shakespeare, Part 3 of 3, by Robert Boo. How Honor, Ashby's, and the Comedy of Errors help answer the Shakespeare authorship question. Hi, my name is Robert Boog. In this video, we'll give you seven reasons to doubt Shakespeare, what Ashby's proves, and the 1597 lawsuit. My website is robertboog.com. Mentioning that anyone other than Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare often causes a knee-jerk reaction of being biased. People will say, your problem is you cannot fathom that someone from a lower class might be a genius or have honor. Not true. We know the definition of honor. We know 12 plays have honor as a theme. So ask yourself if the Glover's son acted honestly and selflessly. And I'll tread carefully about honor. Let's fast forward to the 1597 lawsuit. William Shakespeare was not named in this lawsuit, but John and Mary Shakespeare had his full support and financial backing. In 1597, this lawsuit was about John Shakespeare regaining Ashby's. John Shakespeare claimed he brought the 40 pounds to Edmund Lambert's house in 1580, but Edmund Lambert would not take his money. But in 1597, John was still willing to purchase Ashby's for 40 pounds if John Lambert wanted to do the right thing. John Lambert said he knew nothing about the rights to repurchase. His father told him John Shakespeare had sold Ashby's because he was deeply in debt. John Lambert had lived there for 11 years. Why didn't they file this lawsuit 17 years earlier when his parents were still alive? It's 17 years later. How can John Shakespeare win a verbal contract lawsuit? Easy. Find 10 or 11 witnesses who will swear under oath they heard Edmund Lambert say that John could repurchase Ashby's for 40 pounds. Similar to Oxford, in 1580, Oxford claimed Charles Arundel and Henry Howard were spies. These two men made over 65 charges against Oxford. Seven or eight young boys accused Oxford of sexual assault and serial rape. But who did the Queen believe? Well, we can look back in the calendar of miscellaneous state papers from Spain today, and we can read that Charles Arundel had come to the Spanish ambassador in a great hurry to inform him that a secretary of Lord Admiral Howard, his brother-in-law, had just arrived from England, so that two were spies. Queen Elizabeth knew witnesses could be paid to say anything. After hearing Oxford and the complaints against him, she asked Oxford to attend a party two weeks later on New Year's Day. But who do Shakespeare believers today believe? The two spies. My point is, 10 or 11 witnesses swearing under oath still seems very convincing to people, even today after 400 plus years. If 10 witnesses testified for John Shakespeare, what happened? Well, if you brought your full mortgage payoff to Bank of America, but they said you still owed more money, would you leave your house vacant for two or three years? No. Here in L.A., some homeless person might move into it, right? Most people would live in the house and make mortgage payments, but John Shakespeare never did. Edmund Lambert moved into it. Why? John never moved into Ashby's because he did not own it. Would you try to sell or rent out a house you didn't own? His failure to occupy the vacant house proves it was a sale. John Shakespeare's first purchase on Henley Street in 1556, the lot was 30 feet wide by 85 feet deep. One cow needs one acre of land to graze. Could a cow and a family of seven live there? No. Wouldn't John's wife and five kids prefer to live in a house on four acres? Yes. So here are two reasons why John did not occupy Ashby's. Reason number one, it was a sale. John sold 
Ashby's to Lambert for 40 pounds. It was a sale, not a mortgage. Reason number two, John Shakespeare was already a tenant of a 14-acre farm located in Ingon Meadow. This document, the two conveyances of property dated December 1570, ratified by Queen Elizabeth, proves John Shakespeare was the tenant of a farm. His lease spanned 21 years from May 5, 1564 to May 4, 1585. We can go on to the Shakespeare documented website and they tell you two conveyances of property by William Clopton showing John Shakespeare as a tenant of Ingon Meadow. This is from 1570. If you go to page two here and um, see this top indenture line, drop down 20 lines from the top here. So if we go down 20 lines, we'll come here and see John Shakespeare's name. It says, containing by estimation 14 acres, be it more or less now or late in the tenure or occupation of John Shakespeare or his assigns. So people will see this word or assigns and say, oh, then he probably assigned it to someone. Yeah, he probably did it after 1585. <laughs> okay, so let's go back and where did I come up with the date? May 5th, 1564. That's on page four here. So right above this indenture line is the date for when the lease started. Okay, so it says for term of 20 and 1 years or under and then the date is right here before the fifth day of May in the year of our Lord Christ 1500 three score and four and there from oh sorry so that would be May 5th 1564 if it's 21 years that makes it 1585. So who won the 1597 lawsuit? Well here, the fate of Ashby's as a property is unknown. There are traces of its being in the possession of Adam Edkins in 1668. Charlotte Stopes. Shakespeare believers will tell you John Lambert likely settled out of court and or the Shakespeare's probably won. But John Lambert sold Ashby's for 85 pounds in 1601. John's crooked lease tells us William was not an expert in Latin. Number one, John Shakespeare didn't trust his son's Latin. John leased out Ashby's beforehand to George Gibbs for 21 years. If he knew Latin, why not do both? The crappy lease and the Latin. Number two, according to Ben Johnson in 1623, William Shakespeare knew small Latin and less Greek. And number three, if he was a Latin expert, why didn't William no modify the deed to include John's right to repurchase? Easy, he didn't know how. He wasn't a Latin expert. If William knew little Latin, who cares? After all, don't most Shakespeare plays have little Latin in them? That may be true, but what were the sources for the Comedy of Errors? There were two Latin books, the Monogamy and the Amphitryon. The Monogamy was first translated into English in 1595, and the Amphitryon in 1636. The Comedy of Errors was staged at Gray's Inn on December 28, 1594, so the players had to learn their lines at least, what, three or four months beforehand? So it had to have been written way before 1594. The Rape of Lucrece, 1594, was based on the Fausti, also not translated until 1640. So the writer had to be a Latin expert. Back then, 
the law was written in Latin. So you had to be an expert. Who else had the tools, knowledge, and expertise to write the plays, poems, and sonnets attributed to William Shakespeare? I can think of one person, and that was Edward de Vere. This was his daily regimen. He had music and dance every day, along with French, an hour of Latin, writing. Cosmography means mapping the universe, so he was mapping Latin and French again in the afternoon, and his tutor was Lawrence Noel. And remember William Shakespeare's education? He didn't study history. He didn't study math. He didn't study geography. Shakespeare believers like to say there's no evidence that anyone else other than William Shakespeare wrote the plays attributed to him, other than the collaborations that we know Shakespeare engaged in later in his career. So, there is no reason to doubt him. I disagree. Easy to break one pencil, but can you break nine pencils at once? That's how circumstantial evidence unmasks William Shakespeare. On the outside, it looks like one person, but it's actually two people. One who wrote 12 plays about honor, and the other who hoarded corn and malt during an extreme famine. He evaded taxes. He bought a coat of arms for a man who was not honorable. And he financially supported his father's fraudulent 1597 lawsuit against an innocent man. Here are more reasons. Commoners had inaccurate and distorted maps, right? Look at the Antarctica here. But noblemen had maps, globes, and the money to leave England. The real author translated Latin books not yet translated. John Shakespeare was not an angel. If he knew William could have tweaked a Latin contract to his advantage, do you really think he would have leased out Ashby's for a few bushels of grain? No. So, why did he not do both? Right? I mean, William could have added a clause in Latin about John Shakespeare repurchasing Ashby's in the future for 40 pounds or less, right? But Edward de Vere studied law at Gray's Inn. Since the law was written in Latin, he had to be an expert in it. Number three, books were expensive, and none were seen by the London tax collector. Each year he scrutinized the value of all books, furniture, and clothes, and tallied their worth. For three years, the London tax collector stated William owned personal property worth a total of five pounds. Three years at five pounds means he was not buying any new books, right? The average person who could not read and did not own a musical instrument was assessed three pounds. William, five pounds. Edward de Vere lived at Cecil House with a library of over 3,600 books and maps. From age 12 to 20, he studied mapping. Cosmography. Number four, writing something offensive was severely punished. Any person imagining a monarch's death could be executed, imprisoned, or maimed it was considered an act of treason. For writing a pamphlet offensive to the queen, Edward de Vere's cousin's husband, John Stubbs, had his right hand severed with a meat cleaver. Now think about it. The death of a ruler, we'd have Anthony and Cleopatra. We have King Richard II. Hamlet the death of Julius Caesar, and Macbeth. Number five, math for globes was not taught in grammar schools. The Comedy of Verus mentions a globe, but grammar schools in the 1570s through 1580s did not have globes. William Shakespeare correctly calculated how latitude lines changed over distance without knowing trigonometry, not to mention having bad maps? Again, his education. 
the knowledge of a bridge in Italy without ever leaving England, right? Shylock mentions meet you at the Rialto, which is a bridge over the largest canal in Venice. Remember that? Here's the Rialto Bridge. Here's the Canal Grande. It's a bridge. In Romeo and Juliet, there's a grove of sycamore trees rooted westward of the city. Edward de Vere lived in Italy for over a year. The places he visited in Italy matched the same locations found in the plays of William Shakespeare. Small Latin, less Greek. Due to inaccurate maps, could Shakespeare even locate the Greek city of Amphipolis? Yet, he brings it from what we call modern-day Duras over here, and he brings it over to this eastern side of Greece. Why? To highlight Amphipolis, I think. In Greek, Amphi means both, or two sides, or double, and polis means city-state. So you've got twins from two cities. That's the meaning of Amphipolis. And of course, Oxford was fluent in both Greek and Latin. Here's some views from Syracuse, Sicily, and Ephesus, Turkey. And again, the, the Greek ruins in Ephesus. But it was warm. Amphipolis lies on the 40th latitude line and has a statue. The number 40 is associated with Oxford, not Shakespeare. This is from Alexander Waugh's YouTube video, Saint or Sinner. And here we can see the latitudes on the 40th latitude line. The Viscount Bulbeck's crest boasts a lion shaking a spear. And there is a large statue of a lion where in Amphipolis. It kind of looks like a quill pen, right? Here's the statue of the lion. And in case you missed the point, Viscount Bulbeck was another title belonging to Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. Any artist plugs pieces of his or her life into a project. Like Edward de Vere, Antiphilus of Ephesus had a mistress. Creative people do this, don't they? They will plug pieces of their own life into their work. Edward de Vere also has had a mistress, and that was Anne Vavasour. Edward de Vere may have endured bipolar disorder. Being bipolar might be like two people who look alike but have two different personalities. What would that look like? Well, how about twins? If Oxford had bipolar disorder, what better tool to explain how he felt than writing a play with twins. William Shakespeare lacked the know-how to write the Comedy of Errors, but Edward de Vere did have the know-how. He was called the best poet at Queen Elizabeth's court. He knew both Greek and Latin. Tutored by a cartographer, he knew trigonometry, the map, map making. He had access to a globe, plus his boots were on the ground in Palermo, Sicily. Now here's why this is important. I mean, with Sicily and Ephesus, we really do not think about snow. We know that Sicily is close to Africa, just like Spain. In Los Angeles, many people have never seen snow. When I was in high school, it snowed one time, and they had to stop school because people were outside gazing up at, at the sky. So would people who have never seen snow use snow to describe getting old? No, they don't know what it's like. In ancient maps, Sicily almost touches Africa and has a fiery volcano. It has a warm climate. So when Aegean talks about aging and says grizzled white like snow, it seems odd. Why not say grizzled white like salt or grizzled white like paper or something? In Act 5 of the Comedy of Errors, Aegean mentions winter snow. Aegean, a Syracusan merchant, has lived in Syracuse for the past seven years and has been in Ephesus for three days. 
And here's the line I'm talking about. Though now this granite face of mine be hid in sap consuming winter's drizzled snow, and all the conduits of my blood froze up. Blah, blah, blah. So here's Syracuse, and it's got a fiery volcano. We know it's on the same latitude line as Ephesus, and Ephesus, it's, it's like Los Angeles. You know, it doesn't get cold enough to snow. 55 in January, 59 in December. But there is snow in Sicily. In fact, there's snow in Palermo. Snowy Mountain, Mount Cuccio, Palermo, Sicily, Italy. If he knew Sicily had snow in the winter, perhaps he visited the place. Now, if you count the letters in Shakespeare spelled without an A, you'll find that there are seven in William and ten in Shakespeare. That's 17. We find 17 letters in it, like the 17th Earl of Oxford. But this is just a coincidence, right? The Glover's son lacked honor. He did not have the know-how to write one play attributed to Shakespeare. So how could he write 36 more? For those who ask, why do you doubt that Shakespeare did not write Shakespeare? Why not share this video? This is the end. My website again, robertboog.com. Thank you for watching, and that's all, folks.